So if I see a little bit of knee valgus, if I see a little bit of compensations, whatever you feel that you notice, you can fix that by cueing them properly. I don't need a foam roll. I don't need to put them into a precarious exercise that's going to target or correctively fix. I think more times than not, we can fix and optimize movement by cueing and tactilely giving suggestions. So for example, with her, we would push her elbows out because you push them out, she then has to internally feel that pressure on her arm and she has to correct that. So that cue is going to bring her into the, the better form. When she's squatting, I may have like a, a pole, like a, I always have I'm a weirdo, like a PVC pipe. And I'm going to just kind of graze the side of her knees to drive your knee out. So then she can internalize external rotation. She doesn't know what external rotation is. She doesn't know what knee valgus is. We want to cue her by giving her something that she can, uh, she can learn. That's the motor behavior that, that's going to happen. So we want to optimize movement, get stronger, and keep on building on that via progressive overload. I love this quote. I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. If she wants to get better at jumping and she wants to get better at squatting and she wants to get a stronger upper body, we need to do a lot of those specific movements. Now, we're going to look at that here in a second. Let me go into, we looked at the patterns already and we looked at all this stuff. Uh, patterns that we will do. I want to look at the tenets of what, when it comes to programming. So I want to get each pattern ideally two to three times per week. For the most part, it's going to be full body. Unless Pop says, I want her in with you six times a week. I'd say realistically, she's probably going to be coming in two to three times, which will be full body. We want to focus on the progressions of the movements that you feel are appropriate over the exercise selection. So if she comes in on Monday, I'm not going to do a squat into a deadlift into a, a hip thrust. And then on Wednesday, we're going to do a bunch of running and that's it. So, you know, we need to do the, some of the same exercises and then progressively overload. Don't get lost in all the fluff stuff. I love athletes because I do not program any fluff. I will tell them, do this, rest. We're not doing anything. Bring your homework in. If you want to do some homework during your sets, that's fine. <clears throat> We're going to optimize for that set. We don't need to put in cool Instagram worthy stuff when you're working with athletes. I can focus on core strengthening, anterior core stuff, lateral core, anti-rotation, but rest is the name of the game. We need to be stable before we're strong, before we're powerful, and strong fixes wrong. We want to build on that foundation, but for her, if she hasn't been lifting weights, we want to stick between the 10 to 15 rep range to strengthen connective tissue. Volume, frequency, intensity, those are king. So each week and each time that I train her, we want to check in to see how she's feeling. So again, she had all of the, the competency that I like to design a program. I'm going to take a look at the acute variables. So being consistent, VFI, progressions, exercise selection, the rest, and the tempo. So I'm going to go through and show you guys the NSCA's way of, and this is what we do for um, NSCA's needs analysis. The needs analysis, for those that maybe some of you have gone through, who could tell me what the needs analysis is for athletes? Anyone? I know one of them is um, the injuries or the risk factors, mm -hmm. the muscles involved, yep. um, and like what planes of motion. Getting there. Joint uh, actions. Joint actions. What's the last one? Can I phone a friend? Ah, who, who, who are you phoning? Uh, Jose. Jose, you know? Huh? <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, what was that? <laughs> What's the fourth part of the NSCA needs analysis? Anyone that has to do with the... I don't want to give it away, but the conditioning of the individual, how we use fuel, what's that called? Bioenergetic. Bioenergetic. <laughs> nice work. So 
just we're not going to get into a bioenergetics talk. I do have some talks uh, about maybe two weeks ago on a Saturday. We go over bio or maybe it was a Thursday. Bioenergetics. Essentially, for Ryan, Ryan, I know that you're in the CSCS class. So looking at a volleyball player, ATP, PC, phosphagen system, glycolysis or oxidation, which one would you say they're primarily in? Primarily in? Yeah. Um, damn, I'm going to say the ATP, PCR. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's going to be the majority of their uh, work. If you watch a volley, to throw it up, spike it, quick, point. Or a volley for three, four times, maybe 10. You're not going longer than uh, you know, 20 seconds max. There is an aerobic component to it, sure. But as a strength coach, what I would not want to see, and I, I worked with my niece, she's a D2 volleyball player, and I looked at her programming, and no, I'm not here to step on people's toes, but the strength coach didn't know what the hell they were doing. It started out practice running a mile, and that's just not applicable to the sport. You're doing more harm than good when you have a bunch of volleyball players running a mile. Even if these girls are smoking that shit, they're going six-minute miles. That's not applicable to a volley. <laughs> when are you ever going to be running back and forth for six straight minutes? It's not going to happen. So that's doing too much work with the notion that more is better. So we want to make it specific to the athlete. What are some common injuries you think you're going to see with volleyball players? ACL. Shoulder. Knee. Shoulder. Probably ankles. Maybe some wrist stuff. But those would be the, the main ones. I would definitely say knee would be one. Ankle or shoulder would be two. And then the same for three. So the main muscles that we're working with. What do you guys think? Shoulders, pecs, biceps. Oh, your, your biceps are definitely engaged. Quads. What was that? Quads. Quads for jumping. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Quads, glutes, hands, strength, quads. I would definitely, I would probably put these three as the top three. Now, your shoulder can make reference to your pec because of extension, which we'll look at the next one, and your lats. And so the main actions that we're going to be having is extension at the core and sorry at the, the hip and then extension at the humerus extension so, all right so now that i gather this data when i design a program for someone i'm taking these things into consideration i also need to look at where they are in season off season out of season because uh, there's, there's different phases of a periodized program, which is a year. So as the strength coach, my favorite time of the year, because I'm lazy, does anyone know when that is? Off season? Nope. In season. Mm -hmm. In season, I don't do shit. I literally bring them Gatorade. That's my job. And maybe I'll you know have one or two workouts a week. Nothing crazy. The majority of my work is going to be the off season and preseason. That's the value of a strength coach. I'm writing out my programs and I'm also being facetious. Like it's not like I'm not doing anything. One of my buddies was the strength coach for the Blazers and I'd always give him shit because Ben was his name. And now he's working with Orlando, but you know, he would just literally run around and give them Gatorades during the games. And he would just make sure that they're hydrating properly when the game's over, making sure they're getting enough nutrients when the, uh, off days, but you know, you don't train that hard during the in season. You do train, but it's just not that hard. So the, the work of the strength coach really comes in to individualizing the individual and looking at how we can improve Kyle because he lacks uh, conditioning. Whereas Jen, she needs some more explosiveness for Jose. We want to lose five, 10 pounds. So it, it's going to be, that's my job to individualize it in the off season. So when I design a program like this for a 13-year-old, we, we got to, when we look at the joint actions, a, a lot of it's bilateral. You're going to be jumping bilaterally, but there is a, a very equally important unilateral component. So when I say that, what am I making reference to? Bilateral and unilateral. Single. One leg, two leg. Good. Yeah, one leg, two leg, single. So th there's, a, there's a lot of different ways that you can, incorporate a strength training program maybe you want to do uh, 
your three main exercises and then you do that three times a week, that would be fine as long as we're progressively overloading. You can make a case for that. Maybe you want to have a day where it's more bilateral, have another day when it's unilateral and have a day when you focus more on plyometrics. Again, that would be okay as well. When I look at the programming, I'm looking at the order of operations. So for example, if you were to do... What do you guys think? If this was my day one for, for this hard. girl right here. That'd be way too hard. Yep. So she doesn't have that rep range of five is really heavy. That wouldn't be appropriate for now. I wouldn't want to even see a five by five for a squat to a deadlift back to back for an athlete. That's, a, that's way too much work. And what about the jumps at the end? Doing first. On. Yep. So it'd probably be best to put the jumps. So we can, we can take this program and we can do, let's do jumps three by five with planks first. And we'll, we'll do maybe 30 seconds. And then we need to rest probably two minutes. And then number two, I'll start off with, what do you think would be a better squat variation? Goblet squat. Yeah, I think that would be good for her. And we bump it down to three times, maybe 12, only 15, 12, 10. That's okay. Uh, I'll post tomorrow or maybe after this class tonight, the equipment that she has. And then I want to readdress this tomorrow with how you guys would design your programs. You can copy mine. That's fine. It's a template. This isn't the best way. It's a way. So we got our explosiveness that will be relative to what she wants to do, which is get better with explosiveness. Goblet squat is going to be a squat pattern. So here is a deadlift. Maybe do like an RDL variation. And I would do maybe two to three sets of, let's go with like 10. And then down here, I'll maybe end off on some single leg bridges for two times 12 per leg. I would also do some side planks here. I would do some anti-rotation. Rotate. And then maybe some suitcase walks. There. So probably resting between two minutes per set. I do one. So I do my jumps and then my planks rest. Do that for three rounds and then I go into goblet squats. First set will be the easiest. And I do my side planks, both sides. Add some weight. Side planks, both sides, resting about two minutes. Last round, you know, put a weight on there that would be uh, maybe 20, maybe 25 for her. She gets a solid 12 reps, does her side planks, and then she's now done with two. Then we're going to go into single joint RDLs, two by 10, if she has a kettlebell, dumbbell, whatever, into some anti-rotation. So that's going to work with strengthening her core in the transverse plane. So people can ask, like, how long should you hold these for? You know, how long can she hold it for? I think once you can get past about 10, 15 seconds of a solid hold, then we can progress by stepping out further, maybe going with one arm, maybe getting into the frontal plane. There's a lot of variants that we can do. Don't get too anxious of progressing. So what I mean by that is I see trainers, they'll do day one step ups, day two reverse lunges, day three, just a shit ton of Bulgarians. Like that's way too aggressive. So play around with those variables that we, we put earlier about volume, frequency, intensity, play around with the tempo. RDLs, maybe here, because we're not too concerned about the load, maybe today we do a one by one tempo. And then the next time we do a two by two tempo, as in the next workout. We go two seconds down, hold for one second, isometrically, and we come up for two seconds, just to you know stress the hammies and the posterior chain to strengthen that. And then we do some single leg bridges, two by 12, and then some suitcase walks. So I think that would be a great first day for her. And then when we progress and you look at the next day, I wouldn't do anything the, the next day. I would do a non-consecutive day for her. So then you guys get to make that decision on essentially it would be day three. What do we want to do? Do you want to focus more on the squat pattern? Do you want to focus more on the hinge pattern? Do you want to focus up more on unilateral? And what do you guys, what would you like to do? Can we do uh, box jump ups? 
with a three second hold or yeah I don't know, I'll be okay with that box jumps now when you say a three second hold what are you what are you referencing uh just like jumping from the ground jumping up onto the box and just holding for three seconds try just to learn to absorb the shock that's fine, but let's take a look at what's going to happen to that second jump after she holds for three seconds isometrically. Do you think she's going to have more oomph in her jump or she's going to be a little fatigued? Mm, might be a little fatigued then. Yeah. Huh? So the purpose is to optimize what's called the stress shortening cycle and that explosiveness. We don't want to take away from it. And earlier I put on there, you know, jumps of 15 or 30 seconds. That is defeating the purpose of I mean, you could ask any volleyball player, how many consecutive jumps have you ever done in a row in a game? They don't just jump up and come down and jump up, come down and jump up, come down. They don't do that for 30 consecutive reps. Maybe three. You jump up, but there was like a little um, fake, and they come again. You got to jump up again immediately, and then it gets tipped, and you got to go one more time. Maybe five. I would be intrigued to ask around and survey the girls and say, what is that number? You're not going to hear more than six, seven, eight, nine. So you make it specific to the sport. So I like your box jumps, and then we'll do some hip thrusts. So we focused more on the squat pattern here, and then we're going to do some. Uh, actually, let's let's continue on with what we were doing. So let's do side planks here, and we'll do three times five slash whatever you can do for the. Uh, side planks and let's start off with hip thrust and then we'll do three times 12 into um she did really well you want to do stir the pots so you get a stability ball and you get some rotations in there you felt like it was appropriate to progress her that's just on you as the trainer with the progressions so we have our jumps we have our thrusts let's do our goblets and let's do three by Maybe 10, but let's do a three second eccentric. We're really focusing on that control, and then she she gets up out of it. Maybe you want to put a bench behind her. And when she sits down and you play a little red light, green light, or you snap. And so whenever I snap, you gotta sit, sit up as fast as you can. And go. Up, green light, now. And so you're working on her reactiveness. So when you give her that cue, because look at how specific that is the sport. You can read someone pretty well, but there could be a random little volley or tip. And so you got to be able to react on an external cue. So as the coach, I want to play things like that. And so then we have our hinge, we have our squat. And now we want to do some single arm step ups. Kind of like a variant of the suitcase walks. But we're going to do three by six to eight. And when I, when I put six to eight, I'm not talking about volitional fatigue here. Remember, movement competency, we want to work on her owning that pattern. Now, if I see some crazy valgus, I'll just rub the side of her knee to drive out, make sure we have our big toe, little toe heel on the box at all times. We're working on valgus. We don't want to have her collapse in. And at the end, we have our hinge, we have our squat, we have our unilateral. If you wanted to incorporate some push slash pull stuff in here for a full body, that's on you. You can do that. I'm, my emphasis is going to be primarily lower body. So same thing with like over here when I get into that workout. So maybe at the very end, you do um, uh, four, you do a push-ups, and you do chin-ups, or, or chin-ups, or Aussies, whatever you feel is appropriate so this would be day three and now we're going to make one more which will be day five so these are non-consecutive days so when we look at this my brain is going through okay we have a variant of jumps which i like we have uh, just jump up come down working on the landing day, the second day we have box jumps nice it's not going to be as um you know, demanding on the, the knees. You can even make an argument to put those for day one. They're kind of used inversely. It's fine. But what plane of motion are we getting into right now? Well, uh, unilateral, right? Next. That's not a plane of motion. Oh. oh. Good. So let's either work on frontal plane stability by doing a jump into uh, unilateral landing. 
So you jump bilateral, land on one leg. So now your hip has to stabilize right and left. And so what plane are we kind of testing here? Frontal. Frontal. So I call it a frontal plane stabilizing uh, you know, exercise. And I think that would be really relevant for an athlete who has to go lateral. And you can make some arguments. I want to do ice skaters. That's fine. You know, there, there's a lot of variants, variants of plyos that we can put in here. What I wouldn't want to see would be like depth jumps. It's way too advanced for a beginner. I wouldn't want to see a bunch of repetitive jumps longer than 10 seconds. So like a jump and a jump and a jump and a jump. There's a lot of bounds. I don't think that would be relevant for right now. We want to make it relative to her sport. And so we have a side plank. We did a front plank first and then side plank. So let's do some anti-rotations. Two, we're going to go, we did goblet there. We did thrust there. So let's do some reverse lunges. Three by six to eight into uh, plank variations. Three, she really liked the, the hip thrusts. So now we're going to maybe not be as heavy as the prior time, or, but you, you could see just from that neurological recognition that she could do the same weight, if not more, the second time. So we'll do those into, um, maybe you want to incorporate your push-ups here. That's fine. Four, we'll do goblets into wall sits with med ball. Challenging, challenging, anti-rotation. So we do a, a goblet for 10, 12. This is the third time we do them, so she's getting a lot better. Then we go right to the wall for a wall sit, hold a ball out in front of us, and we tap the ball around. So now we're really looking into fatigue as a factor because before we just did our goblets and we did a core exercise, but now we're doing a, a goblet into a core isometric stabilizer. So I think that would be a good progression from day one to day five. And then maybe at the end here, you wanna do some airplanes or some band walks. Maybe if you had a, a reverse hyper machine, those are gonna isolate the hamstrings. Maybe since we have a stability ball, we do leg curls. Because when we look at injuries, the common injuries are going to usually be due to a lack of frontal plane stability, that's the valgus, or a lack of hamstring strength. So we incorporate those into the program. Maybe you give her some homework and you say, um, Natalie, I want you to do single leg bridges every day. Maybe we want to incorporate some clams. If you have a band, and this is that value add that you can, you can work with. So if her dad were to come in with her, I'm going to give them something to take home for free. I'm gonna give them some bands, something, even if it's 20, 30 bucks, it's an investment into my client and they're gonna really appreciate that. So worst case scenario, they can't sign up because financially they can't afford it. What you're gonna do is you're gonna help this girl probably have one of the best years of her career and most importantly, not get injured. That $20 investment's gonna go so far in helping them and that's why we're doing this, right? So give them something. The dad's going to be very grateful and say, you know, this is a great experience. In the future, I'd like to come back in three, four, five, six months. You keep them into your, your Rolodex. You reach out every couple of weeks. You send them a new workout plan. It's not hard to go that extra 10%, that extra mile. And then what's going to happen is maybe a month, maybe three months, maybe six months from now, maybe a couple of years. That is going to turn into a new opportunity. And dad's going to remember that, you know, when I worked with that trainer, he was really professional. We couldn't afford it at the time. He gave us a band. He didn't need to do that. That was a $20 investment. And if they want to pay the dad, say, here's 20 bucks, you take it. That's fine. Whatever. But if you buy 20, 30 bands, I buy them from one of our trainers, Chelsea. I think I got like 30 of them for, it was like less than 400 bucks. So it came out to like 15. So I'll sell them to students. I don't make a profit. I just want to get them out there because a lot of students like them. And so then she can do these things at home. And, and then maybe you start using her as like a, almost like a little tester where you tell her, it's like, hey, follow me on Instagram. If any of your girlfriends on the team, if they sign up with me, I'll give you a commission. It's like, you can work different angles. 
Maybe you set up an appointment with her coach to see if you can do a Zoom call for everyone one day a month to talk about nutrition. Maybe it's to go over common injuries that they're getting. When you're given someone, when you have someone in front of you, I hate it when trainers look at it as a transaction. So all they're focusing on, I got to sign them up, got to sign them up, got to sign them up. And then they leave and you're like, ah, fuck it. This is, I, I got to go find someone else. Take that as an opportunity to help someone. They're in front of you. Provide the value that you, you, you have because you're knowledgeable trainers. Give more. And then keep on giving if they don't sign up. I cannot stress enough. You put them into your email. Maybe you start your own um, sports specific stuff and you send out uh, emails to them around you know, how to train athletes. I wrote for stack.com that got me into writing and I really enjoyed doing that. I still have a couple of articles on there that you know generated over a hundred thousand views. I was the first one to write about hip thrust on stack.com. So it could open up an opportunity for you to write more and then maybe someone finds you and the next thing you know, your writing career takes off. So there, there's just so much that you can do from an opportunity like this. You always need to think of it as, how can I help not only her, but maybe her dad needs my help. Maybe her team needs my help. Maybe the coach needs my help. Maybe the coach has someone who I can help. Maybe the school needs a strength coach. There's so many opportunities. If you look at it as this 13 year old is not going to fucking sign up with me. This is stupid. I'm, not, I'm just going to go through this quickly. You're not in it for the right reasons. And so when you go, come back to the needs analysis, we're taking care of strengthening the hips. We're putting a lot of emphasis there in an appropriate way. We are incorporating jumps. And you could even say like, well, she's not ready for it. In a matter of a month, maybe two months, she's going to be doing it already because of her sport. So let's optimize her jumps. And we can do that by keeping the rep count low, resting optimally. We're doing a squat pattern, a hinge, and a unilateral. We're working on uh, incorporating the, the joint actions in the muscles. We didn't do much with bioenergetics because I'm just designing these workout programs off season. Now, if she specifically said that she wants to improve her conditioning, would you want to incorporate like high intense cardio conditioning in the beginning or more at the end? The end. Yeah. So that's when you'd want to, you know, I think best case scenario would be like you train her three, four, five times a week and two, three, two to three of those days are going to be geared towards resistance. And then one or two of those days will be, maybe you actually even go to the high school, the volleyball and you do suicides and you do conditioning drills there with your plyometrics. So in that case, if I were to train her five times, I'd actually take the jumps out here. I'd move up the resistance portion, take those plyos, bring them to when I'm at the, the court and do the plyos for the first 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes, and then get into the conditioning aspect. So there is a hierarchy of where we put everything. It needs to be the most explosive things first, then it needs to be anaerobic conditioning, and then we end off on aerobic conditioning. So again, when I look at a program and I see someone who runs a mile before a practice, that tells me they don't understand the specificity of the sport. You want to leave that stuff more towards the end. There will be times, let's see if you guys can play along with this. When do you think it would be an appropriate time to have a, a team or a teammate run a mile or so before the practice starts? They're crossfitters or something like that. Track. I used to have to run two miles before practice. Why? Because I was a sprinter and I hated running, so I needed that extra mile. Okay. Again, in that in that case, because of your sport, I put it at the end. I'm looking at more of a kind of a trick question, but as a punishment. Client, you know, student comes in five minutes late, you little shit, go out there, run a mile. <laughs> like that's your punishment. Or you know, stupid play. At the end of the game, it was tied up. And the girl takes the volleyball and throws it at the, the head of the ref. Okay, you little fucker. You're going to have some punishment from that. So I use that as a form of punishment because most people hate running. I'm not going to implement things that are going to compromise the integrity of the athlete's performance, though. So what are some questions you guys have? And this is more advanced. This is taking an athlete through a sports-specific program that's relative to their sports energy and requirements and, and their needs. What are some questions you have? I, I did have a question. Are these set up to be a circuit or you just do the do number one and then you rest and do it again? 
Yep. Okay. So how for this one right here, for example, I didn't put the reps on here. So let's just go three by twelve, um, three by six, and then like thirty seconds. So I would do the jump for a set of six into my anti rotations for thirty seconds. I would rest for two minutes, and I'll go into jump number two. Do that okay. for six, and then my anti rotations round three, six rotations. Then I'm done with them. So I won't go back to number one. You'll also okay. see it like in like NSCA lingo. It'll be like an exercise here. And then here, and then here, and then and see. And then whenever you see a two, that means that you just do all of the ones together, and then you'd go to your twos. So that's how okay. strength coaches will write out their programs. And I have a, another question to piggyback off of that. Mm -hmm. What are the benefits of doing it this versus a circuit? Like how to choose which is more advantageous? So what type of circuit are we making? Because I would even classify these as circuits because you're doing more than okay. one exercise. So a straight set would be just one, okay. just a jump and that's it. You don't do anything else, just a squat okay. or just a bench press. So the, the gotcha. fact that I have an, an A or an accessory or complementary movement or exercise, okay. I would classify that as a circuit. It's just maybe what okay. you're asking is how many exercises do we put into the circuit? Okay. You, can, you can make an argument to do like a jump into a push up into a plank. You could do that. I, I mean, I wouldn't say that's wrong. I think mm -hmm. that that would be perfectly acceptable. And that's what the, your homework is. I'm going to post today later on what the equipment looks like. Pretend like you're the strength coach and you have access to this equipment. I want you guys to implement a, we'll start with one. If you want to design two, three workouts, this would be a really, really good exercise for you to have that foundation. So in the future, if someone comes in and goes, my daughter's a, or my son's a volleyball player, looking for a program. You don't have to think about it anymore. It's already done. So put your time in now. Spend a good 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. That's all right. Don't strive for it to be perfect. This is not perfect. This is fine. All my programs that I designed are fine. <laughs> I don't strive for, oh, this is the best program. No, just do it. It's, 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 it's written out where I'm going by the laws of programming. I'm doing multiple jointed things first. I'm doing large muscles first. I'm making, I'm making sure to optimize tension or explosiveness first. So that hierarchy, when it comes to an athlete, needs to be in play. So what I wouldn't want to see, again, as I, as I talked about in the beginning, where you're doing a bunch of exhaustive exercise, battle ropes, into jumps, into push-ups. Like, that's not relative to that athlete. Bosu ball squats into this. It's like, no, <laughs> stop doing that shit. Make it relative to that individual. And so the trainer, oh, you know, I want them to have fun. Your athlete will have fun when they're holding the seventh fucking trophy of the Super Bowl above their head. That's when they're having fun. <laughs> Let's not worry about the, the fluff and the fun for an athlete. You get them the results. This, Who else? Uh, this may be more of like a CSCS question, but when would be the optimal time to train? Because normally, if you're dealing with athletes, they're either – coming from practice or going to practice so does it matter would it be more dependent upon like if you're going power strength day or like is there an optimal time to have that session yeah so that's a great question ryan it is it depends as you you could relate to this probably because as you know you're given times when the gym is open and you right. may have the girls team at another time so it all depends on that schedule. One of the most magnificent things I ever saw in, in action was the head strength coach for UConn. And this, this guy was this, one of the top strength coaches in the world. He passed away a couple of years ago, but he would have this gym and he would have football linemen in there for 30 minutes. And then he would have volleyball in there for 30 minutes. And then he would have swimmers in there for 45 minutes. And it was just the perfect... It was like an orchestra. And you could watch this. And you're like, it is chaos. You got big ass dudes lifting heavy shit. Then you have basketball players doing crazy stuff over here. And it was just perfectly ran, all based off of the schedule that he was given. And so you know, in a perfect environment, in a perfect world, time isn't an issue. So if, if, if I'm given an opportunity to train someone and they say, okay, I want you to do cardio conditioning and workouts on the same day, then I'll probably want to have the, the, do the anaerobic explosive stuff in the morning, get enough fuel to recover 
after school, maybe three o'clock, that's when we get into the weight training. That will be like perfect case scenario. And so, you know, can you give me a little more of what you're thinking on, on your environment? Yeah. So, you know, I kind of have good flexibility, but it's, but it's either we go pretty early, like 5 a.m., 6 a.m., or we go right before practice at three o'clock, or we go after practice at six. And that just seems to be terrible. They don't, they don't want to be there at six o'clock lifting weights. Yeah. Yeah. So are, are you designing the explosive component as well? Yeah, I'm, I have to do it all. But I mean, obviously, because we've been off for a year, it, we're going to go really slow and, you know, hit our foundations. But I just, there's a part of me that says go early, because like what you said, that will give them time to go home, rest, refuel, and come back fresh. But I know, you know, dealing with the, the group that I'm dealing with, they probably want me to go at three, but then that could lead to some declines in the, the actual yeah. practice. Yeah, so I, I would want to have them come in for an hour workout, do your first 15, 20 minutes explosive, and then do a 30, 40 minute resistance training. We're not going to volitional fatigue with athletes. Like I'm not gonna be testing their one rep max on bench press. I'm not doing you know goblet squats where it's maximal volitional fatigue because their goal isn't hypertrophy. Their goal is, hy their go their goal is performance. So that's what we really need to remember is that when you're working with an athlete, they have different goals. So if I'm training a bro and he wants to get a big chest, we're going to push it to fatigue. Whereas a basketball player, you may want to do bench press at 60% of what they're capable of, but you do dead stops and you work on just the explosiveness because that's going to be training their type 2X muscle fibers that are a lot more specific to their sport. So I would prefer morning, refuel up. They typically want to see... Uh, when it comes to, and this is stuff that you're learning in the, the CSCS, but you, you want to be getting, uh, we're looking at <clears throat> replenishment between 50 to 100 grams is probably like a minimal amount that you want to see before you get them back in for that second workout. Ideally, a muscle glycogen replenishment uh, would be based off of lean body mass. So you would change it per individual. And that's just going to help with recovery to make sure that you're not going to have diminished returns like you were saying. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So any other questions on implementing this? And again, this is for a 13-year-old. And I really respect the pops because he didn't say what I get a lot of, which is okay. You will learn how to have these conversations. But what is a very common concern that you have with parents and their kids lifting weights? Growth. Yep. Uh, go ahead, Jose. Yeah, the question is like, what if um, the athlete that you're training, he has a history of, let's say, some dysfunction in, let's say, shoulders? Would you recommend to implement the corrective exercise as a warm up or as a cool down, um, um, you know, part? of the workouts? Always depends on the context of the individual. How dysfunctional are we? Is it compromising the integrity of the other movements? I think you can do a combo of everything you mentioned, do it as a warm up. You could even put it in here as like a, a B or an A. So jump mm. into, you know, one band here and you're working on single arm horizontal abductions to work on that dysfunctional side if you need more you know, depression or retraction, whatever it is for that individual. And then you can also do it at the end of your workout. Your clients are terrible at homework. So just remember that if you give your clients or your, your athletes homework, okay, I want you to do three sets of 10 of these at home, they're probably not going to do them. So you can just put it in there as an accessory, as long as it doesn't compromise the main exercise. So to go back on what I mentioned earlier, uh, stunting your growth is the main concern. And there's a really cool study looking at young kids and we're looking at like five-year-olds and they were jumping off of, I believe it was a 48 inch height desk. And the amount of force production on their bones was like fourfold. Is four feet high for a young kid to jump off of? No. I think so. Yeah. They're jumping off like roofs and shit. You know, you let your kids run around they're, they're jumping all over. Four feet isn't that high in retrospect. And so that didn't have any negative effect on their bones. So like, kids will jump even higher than that. So basically what they found was it's okay to go heavier with kids, but you need to be careful of getting less than 10 reps 
because kids aren't going to get absolutely massive. Why aren't they going to go through a lot of hypertrophy? Haven't uh, testosterone. They haven't gone through puberty, so they don't have the hormones in play yet. So then you can make a really good argument. Why is little Johnny getting down to a five rep max? Let's just focus on owning the, the movements. I'll have my kids doing push-ups and bench press and squats, all of that. But the rep range is going to be 10 to 15. And then when little Johnny starts talking to me with a deeper voice, I go, oh, shit, welcome to manhood. Let's go lift some heavy shit now. Let's go. He's ready for it because mm -hmm. his, his connective tissue is there. His movement competency is there. So it's a great opportunity to really start pushing it. So I, I wouldn't. you don't have to be concerned about – stunting your growth now always be respectful of the parents because they're going to have you know preconceived notions that well my doctor says it's bad for you so i totally understand what you're talking about and i feel for what you know you're ex expressing right now so what i'm going to do is i'm going to send you and I'll, I'll send you guys right now a it's called a acsm position stand on um, they typically have a skateboard in the closet when they say that they're against it <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, so this is probably one of the better ones. Yeah. And this goes over a position stand with kids lifting weights. And it just shows that it's perfectly fine. This is a bunch of doctors who a position stand is going to be uh, not like an article that, you know, <clears throat> some influencer on Instagram wrote. This is a bunch of doctors who come together and they present the most up-to-date information. So a position stand is just saying that doctors agree it's not bad for your kid's bone health. Any other questions about programming for an athlete, volleyball specific? Well, let's just say the parents, like, I want to spike that volleyball really hard. Because you get some parents like that. Like, yeah. I mean, you want it. I'd always want to try to get involved with the coach to see oh, yeah. uh, where you can, you know, maybe you can separate some of that. The coach does the, the actual game time specific stuff. I'm just going to work on strength and conditioning. If you have a background with volleyball and you felt like, I mean, I don't know shit about like hitting balls and stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, I would just do the strength and conditioning. And when it comes to that, one, that's what I have them do. Okay. Sounds good. Hey, Chris, I got a question completely yep. off topic, if you don't mind. Yep. So when you have a, just say a client that really their, their main focus is on toning up their muscles. They're not, they're not obese. They're, they're in great shape. They just want to tone up. Is that where you would really manipulate the 12 to 15 range with higher load to really create that tone? What are your thoughts on that? So when people say tone, they want to tone up, they just want to shred up a little bit. Is that what you really manipulate on the, the – um, that's in the reps? I mean, the tone is – as people will say it's a garbage term. They don't like it, but that's what your clients – that's what they, they realize. So what we want to do is we want to just decrease the fat, increase the muscle, and that's going to happen by exercising regularly. And so right. I play into it and say, oh, yeah, you, the higher reps, you're burning more calories, and we're going to drop that fat and increase your muscle. Uh, if you want to work like into a 20, 15, 12, 10 rep range, all toning is is just losing fat and developing muscle. So if, if you want to yeah. give, give people challenges. So if I'm working with a, a dude and he wants, you know, like a toned up chest, like once you start hitting – body weight for 20 reps on bench press, you're going to be seeing that tone. Or for a girl, I'm going to say, once you can do five chin-ups, your arms are going to be significantly more toned than they are now. Are you mm. kidding me? I can't even do one. That's a challenge. So we got to work on getting one. Mm. When we get to one, we get to two, we get to three, we get to four. So just, it's to encourage the progressive overload. Got it. Thanks, Chris, Chris, it seems you're, you don't like fluff that much for athletes and stuff like that. I know you interviewed Joel Seedman for uh, your book and stuff like that. Uh, what's your take on – I mean, I'm sure if you use those exercises of his for accessory and stuff like that, I'm sure it appears he makes too much of some stuff. But I don't know. What What do you think on all yeah, that? It's a loaded I, question, I suppose. But If you don't know who Joel Seedman is, he was actually on our board of education, and I had to take him off because he got a little too polarizing, and he's – 
when you start in the academia world and, and you start getting a little too voodoo-ish, uh, your respect goes down. So you have to be careful of who you associate with. And top professors in the game, top strength coaches, they view him as like, you know, kind of like a con artist because of the exercise that he does. And they're like just too out there. You know, I, I, I always give people the their due diligence and like i haven't had much of a conversation with why he's implementing this stuff maybe he's trying to be polarizing like i have in certain aspects and he's doing it to yeah. get people to, to notice him if i can do something and i grow my social media from five thousand followers to a hundred thousand yeah. followers and some of those people now come into my facility and i'm then able to take them through an appropriate screen and help them where they where they can get to where they want to be and then I filmed some of the stuff on the back end and people want to take a piece of my programming and, and just bash it, but they don't yeah. know what my whole programming looks like. I don't think yeah. that's fair. So I'll always be right in the middle. I would say the stuff that he does is creative as shit. I think those yeah. exercises are great for clients. Actually, I would not imp implement them with athletes. So when I train athletes, fluff is absolutely taken out. And that's what I love working with athletes is because they're there for one reason it's to get better. And I don't need to explain the rest periods because this is the great thing about being a strength coach is the hierarchy. So if I have a kid that's pushing back against me and Ryan's the head coach and this kid's saying, I want to do some fun stuff. I, I can basically say, shut the fuck up. Sh sh shut up. <laughs> We're not doing fun shit. We're getting results. And if this kid starts giving me shit, guess who I'm going to go to? Coach. Yeah. Ryan. Hey, I want to let you know 24 they're just, they're hard. And so Ryan will then say, hey, we're gonna have a little meeting. Your PT is now cut in half, your playing time. And so that's gonna put the, the athlete right in line. And I love that about working with, because the structure I feel like is just so much better. Clients, the trainers come, the clients come in, athletes, sorry, and they just get the work done and then they move on. But with clients, you get so much of the, well, this influencer said this, and this person said this. So you have to play that game, and you got to do some of the fun stuff because because they go home and they sit their ass on the couch for five hours, and they're watching, they're binge watching Netflix, and then they yeah. get on their phone, and that's it. So I do have to cut it a little short tonight because Danny and I are going to hop on a quick little, um, I forget the name of it. What's it called? Clubhouse. So we have a clubhouse call here. We're trying to get more involved with getting people there. If you want to get into that clubhouse, get on there. Uh, it's in her story. Just swipe up and then get into it. We're going to talk about social media and also building businesses. So hopefully you guys found this helpful. If you would like more of the sports specific stuff, then I, this is what I love. So this is like stuff I don't do that much anymore because of just my capacity as teaching trainers, but I do have my CSCS and I've worked a lot with strength athletes and you know, it's good to have a little variety for you guys to kind of get a little taste of different programming for other athletes. So I'm going to hop on over there to the other call. You guys enjoy the rest of your night. Heck yeah. Good night. Yep.